So there's this telescope called the Square Kilometre Array, big radio telescope. Uh, it's going to be one of the massive facilities that's going to be built in the next 10 or 20 years. In a remote and inhospitable desert, something incredible is being planned. Because it's in radio astronomy, it needs to be in pretty kind of boring places where no one lives. Because fortunately, you know, in, 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 in Europe or in most parts of the world, you know, we like to have mobile phones and these things all tend to kind of cause interference with this clean radio signature we're trying to look for from these very tiny, faint things. And the, one of the undecided things about this telescope was where it was going to go. And the two choices were uh, either Africa, mostly southern Africa, but with some bits up into northern Africa, or Australia with little bits in New Zealand as well. There had been an initial report. A uh, committee had been set up to decide you know, what the favoured site was. And so they had made their report, and their report favoured Africa. And so a decision that just last week was taken as to whether to go for the South Africa option or the uh, Australia-New Zealand option. And in the end, they decided to kind of go for both. The kind of a win-win situation. There are three different types of antenna they're going to build. Two, they're going to site in South Africa, and one, they're going to site in Australia and New Zealand. It will survey the sky 10,000 times faster than existing telescopes. As well as all the scientific issues, there's politics involved, there's personalities involved, there's the fact that both Africa and Australia have put quite a lot of money into this and, you, and the people who are heavily involved in this project will obviously want them both to continue putting money into this and clearly if they've made a decision that cut one of them out of the equation that would you know, reduce that likelihood of, of any extra money coming in through that route. I think it was a right decision. I think it was a, it was a good decision. Both, both countries and continents were keen to host it. So there was a lot of goodwill, political goodwill. And I think that what they've done is they've kind of, they've, the different types of antennae are kind of good for different science. And so the two they're sighting in South Africa complement each other. And the one they've picked, they're, they're going to site in, in Australia, New Zealand, does a kind of complementary science. And so I think actually it was a, it was a, it was a really a kind of a, a solution that should make most people happy for most things. It's not quite as daft as it sounds. In fact, it's not at all daft, is really the bottom line. Um, firstly, the thing to bear in mind is that although this is called a single telescope, it's actually a whole bunch of telescopes. Firstly, there's a whole bunch of different uh, dishes of one kind or another. But secondly, it actually works in different frequency regimes. There's bits working at, at long wavelengths, so it's all radio waves, but some of them are longer waves, some of them are shorter waves. And you actually have different technology for each of those and different detectors, different kinds of detectors for them. And so because there's essentially several telescopes there, there was nothing to stop them putting one telescope in one place and the other telescope in another place and still operating it as a single observatory, but not having the two things co-located. Even though there are different parts observing at slightly different wavelengths, I would have thought it was advantageous to observe an object with both types of detector at exactly the same time, which you obviously can't do if one's in Australia and one's in Africa. You can't all the time. I mean, there will be possibilities for simultaneous obs uh, observations. And, and yeah, it's true. You, you, there are some compromises here in terms of if you really want simultaneous observing at a particular time at all wavelengths. But that's a relatively small part of the science case. So although it was a kind of a negative, it's a, a relatively small negative which you can stack up against all the positives. Um, so yeah, no, there's, there clearly are issues involved. And of course, you know, you can't, there's some parts of the sky you can see from one that you can't see from the other. Um, so it does change the science you can do, but not in any particularly disastrous way. The SKA will revolutionise our understanding of the cosmos. No, so it's called the Square Kilometre Array, but actually the reason it's called that isn't because it's a square kilometre in size, it's because if you added up all the collecting areas, so all the dishes, they would add up to a square kilometre, a thousand metres by a thousand metres. So that's a, a million square metres of collecting area. So it's really just the collecting area. But of course they're spread out over huge distances. And so you have a series of stations um, that comprise, uh, some of them are detectors of dishes and some of them are actually just antennae. They're kind of phased array things. So there's lots of different technologies going on. Um, and then you've got these kind of, um, like a, a, a sea of these little dishes in one place. And then there'll be another uh, collection of these, maybe 10 kilometres away, and another collection 100 kilometres away, and another collection 1,000 kilometres away. Because one of the things you want to do in radio astronomy is get as many different baselines as you can. It turns out as the more and more different distances there are between your radio dishes, the more complete picture you can actually create of the radio sky. So that's the reason why they want to spread it out over these enormous distances. The very long baselines tell you about the very sort of sharp details of what's going on. The very short baselines tell you about the large scale distribution of things. And when you combine all this together, you can produce a, a kind of complete picture of the radio sky. There are potentially 
some complications because of the fact that it's on two continents. But I think it's going to be able to do pretty much everything that it originally set out to do, even though these two things are, are somewhat disparate. Another analogy would be there's a new millimetre array being, still being constructed in Chile, and it's called ALMA. And in ALMA, they have arrays being built by, by the Japanese, by Europe, and by the US. And they all kind of, even though they're all kind of slightly different designs, they are all kind of working together and to want to build you know, a better, more powerful observatory. And I kind of see it in the same way with SKA. The SKA will search for gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time. There's fun stuff like you could detect television signals from, from planets around relatively nearby stars, so we can watch telly if anyone's watching it uh, in, in other uh, planetary systems. Um, but there's more serious science than, obviously than that. Perhaps, I mean, from my perspective, I tend to study galaxies and the formation of structure in the universe. So the piece of science I'm most excited about is that the, most of the material, the sort of normal material in the universe is gas, right? And gas emits at radio wavelengths. The hydrogen gas in the universe emits at this famous 21 centimeter line, okay? Now, and that's, you know, that's 21 centimeters in the nearby universe, but because the universe is expanding, the emission from more and more different distant hydrogen is shifted to longer and longer wavelengths. So actually, if you want to study this hydrogen gas all across the universe, you need it at 21 centimetres, but all these red-shifted uh, wavelengths, so all these longer wavelengths as well. So one of the things that this telescope will do is it'll map out the gas in the universe out to enormous distances. And so it will, in the process, of course, a lot of that gas is kind of bound into galaxies, so it'll detect those galaxies. So we'll be able to detect billions of galaxies across the universe, see that structure forming. And of course, as you look to more and more distant gas, you're looking back in time because those radio waves have taken longer and longer to get to us. So you can actually see how the structure in this gas is building up in the universe over time. If most people are happy and this decision seems so logical, why did we have this competition in the first place? Why wasn't it always just going to be this dual sighted to keep everyone happy? Why did we go through all this unnecessary suspense of who's going to get it, who's going to get it? Oh, I I, 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 can't, I can't say, I, mean, I think it's good to have this competition. And I think really, you know, what you wanted was for, for whoever was to host it, you kind of wanted a political push to it too. You know, I think if, if, there, if there had been reluctance on the part of either of those nations, then that would have probably been already a kind of a, a no-no really for it to be a successful project. I think, you know, really the last few years have, have shown that both governments have been convinced of the benefits that this project would bring to them. So I think you know, it, it's really taken until now to have that kind of really proven uh, dedication to this project that's really led to, the, led to the outcome that people are happy with. We seem to live in a time where these space telescopes are the sexy things, where they're up above the atmosphere and they're not, you know, they've got that perfect view. Does this telescope suffer from being stuck on the surface of the Earth? Not so much. I mean, if you think about it for a moment, you know, one of the things that, that Jodrell Bank in the UK is famous for is doing radio astronomy, and that's in Manchester. And the other thing that Manchester's famous for is that it's usually cloudy. And so actually, clearly, you know, you can actually do radio astronomy because the radio waves do go through the clouds. It, it turns out that it does matter to an extent um, because some of the wavelengths they want to be looking at are actually affected by things like water vapour in the atmosphere. And so that's part of the reason, another of the reasons why they want to go to dry places like Australia or parts of Africa. I think it's a step towards something that we hope to happen. I think they, they, they recognise the fact that it's, it's like a billion dollar budget. You know, it's a big budget thing. It's still relatively cheap, of course, compared to most things that go into space. These things are kind of super, super high expensive. But um, the way they're going to build it, they're going to build it in different phases. So even the, even the kind of phase one part, which I think is going to be in South Africa, will still be kind of, you know, much better than anything else we have right now in radio astronomy in the world. So even the phase one part, which is you know, only a small fraction of the total, will still outperform anything else that there is right now. It will take us on a voyage into the unknown. Who knows what else it may reveal?